Hello. So let's continue uh, with uh, linear programming. So last time we were talking about linear programming. And uh, let me just very briefly review some things that we said uh, last time. So first, uh, when we have a linear program, remember that we have an objective function. That objective function can be in the form of minimization or maximization. And then we have uh, some uh, constraints. And the constraints can be like a summation less than or equal to something, could be like the summation greater than or equal to something or the summation equal to something else. And uh, the variables in general can be um, greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to zero or unconstrained. So um, there is a way in which we can transform each one of the problems into a different version. We already talked about how to transform minimization into maximization and vice versa by multiplying uh, the objective function by minus one. We already talked about how to transform greater than or equal to constraints into less than or equal to constraints or equal constraints into both of them. And also we can transform unconstrained version so the case of unconstrained variables, if uh, xi can be any possible value, we can actually transform that into two variables. One, which is going to be called x plus, which is going to be greater than or equal to zero, and another variable, which is x minus, which is going to be less than or equal to zero. So we can also transform uh, problems into those. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, good to transform the problem into an equivalent version. In this case, the problem is called a standard form. So a problem is going to be in a standard form if it satisfies that all variables are non-negative. If it also satisfies that all constraints are equations. So all constraints are equations. And that the objective function is to minimize. So given a problem in any of these, uh, with any of these kinds of constraints and objective functions, we can always transform this problem into standard form. We were also talking about the simplex algorithm. So remember that the simplex algorithm, what it's going to do is you have a, a feasible region and you start by looking at vertices along that feasible region and computing a vertex, next vertex, according to the value of the objective function. So you can see that in the case of several dimensions, there might be several choices where to move. And you're going to make a greedy approach at uh, each point. In order to solve this, I'm not going to do this, but uh, if you are interested in how this works, uh, the simplex algorithm is usually going to work in uh, the case when we transform the problem into the standard form. So all constraints are equations, which means that we actually have a system of linear equations. And in order to find out what the next position is, where is it that we're going to move to, we solve the system of linear equations using Gaussian elimination. So each iteration is going to be in the order of n times m, where n is the number of variables, and m is the number of equations. So 
So we perform one step of Gaussian elimination when for, for each of the iterations of the simplex algorithm. The problem with this approach is that it might happen that at some point we are going to require a exponential number of operations because of the number of vertices that we have the total number of vertices that we have is going to be n plus m choose n and this is going to be an exponential function so the problem with the simplex algorithm is it might require exponential time however we might say that in practice the simplex algorithm usually is very efficient. And there are only some special cases where it requires an exponential time. However, the worst case complexity, theoretically speaking, is going to be exponential, so it is not a very good algorithm from the theoretical point of view. However, from the practical point of view, it is fairly efficient and is uh, commonly used to solve most of uh, simplex, uh, most of uh, linear programming problems. Uh, there are two important algorithms which are polynomial. The first one Uh, requires polynomial time and this was the first one that was proven to be polynomial time. However, um, it's from the practi practical point of view is not very efficient in practice. So for all practical applications, it's really not very good. It has huge constants and so it takes too long. Uh, so, but from the theoretical point of view, this actually was uh, very important because it was able to prove that uh, the linear programming problem can be solved efficiently in polynomial time. So this other algorithm, Karmarkar's algorithm, um, is also useful, but this is also more, more useful in practice also. So in practice, it can actually solve the problem in polynomial time, but uh, it's more efficient than uh, the previous algorithm. More efficient than the other algorithm that I wrote here. However, it's still um, not very much used in practice because what happened after this algorithm appeared is that people started working more on simplex algorithm to try to make it better. So now simplex algorithm is still much better than this other algorithm, even though from the theoretical point of view, the problem can be solved in polynomial time, still simplex algorithm is the one that is going to be used. So it's really not better than uh, newer versions of the simplex algorithm. So for the circuit evaluation problem, we are going to assume that we have several Boolean variables. Let's call those Boolean variables x1, x2, x3. Boolean variables can be only true or false. So I have those Boolean variables. And then we have a Boolean circuit evaluation, which is just a Boolean circuit with gates. So I'm going to write, I'm not going to use the symbol that is usually used for gates. Not sure if everybody uh, knows all the notation, but I'm just going to use this for gates. Uh, so we have several kinds of gates like and or and not. So 
we take x1, for example, and x2, and this is going to give me a, so an answer. Uh, that answer is going to be whatever x1 was and whatever x2, one, x2 was. So using uh, my usual truth table, I can determine what value we're going to get here, right? If x1 is, is true and x2 is false, then we get false because the end is false. If x1 is true and x2 is true, then we would get it true. And we can uh, keep going. So this basically is the design of a circuit that uses those variables. So let's say that I have x2 and x3 connected by an OR, and then I get a solution here, right? So the solution can be, as we said, if x2 is true, x3 is false, then the answer for the OR is going to be true. Okay, and then we have, for example, not, so we can have the negation, and I might get the answer from here. So negation of x3, if x3 is true, the negation is false, and vice versa. And then I can continue building my circuit and I can add another gate. So I can have an OR, or gate here and I can have another gate here. Let's say that I put a negation. And then let's say that I take those two as inputs and I put those into an AND. And then finally I get my output. So the question that we want to answer with this problem is if we apply the rules of logic is the output going to be 1? So we're going to give names to the variables. We started here x1, x2, and x3 and the output we're going to put it as x0 or x0 and so this is going to be part of uh, the part of the variables that we're going to be using. And then what we're going to do is we're going to transform this into a linear programming problem. How do we transform it into a linear programming problem? Well, each one of these uh, gates is going to be transformed into a sequence of equations. So let's, let, let me do each one of those. Let me talk, take the OR, for example. So we have the OR, and let's suppose that we have two variables that are going to the OR. Let's say that is H, XH and XH prime. And this one has a value of our output that is, let's call it XG. So what we do is we're going to write the following constraints. XG greater than or equal to XH. XG greater than or equal to XH prime. And XJ, sorry, XG, less than or equal to xh plus xh prime. You can easily check and verify that if uh, the variables satisfy these conditions, then the variables uh, have to satisfy the conditions required by the OR clause. And so this is the first one. The next one is an AND. So let me take here AND. So again, this is xh xh prime and the output is xg and so in this case uh, xg is going to be less than or equal to xh xg is going to be less than or equal to xh prime and xg is going to be greater than or equal to xh plus xh prime minus one so for example um Suppose that this one is 1 and this one is 1, 2, right? If both of them are 1, what is the value that we expect from xg, right? So if xh is 1 and xh prime is 1, from here we can see that xg is less than or equal to 1, right? xg is less than or equal to 1, right? Because both of them are 1. And xg is going to be greater than or equal to 1 plus 1 minus 1. So this is saying xg is less than or equal to 1, and this one would be saying xg greater than or equal to 2 minus 1, which is 1, so xg greater than or equal to 1. Therefore, xg has to be 1 in the case of 1, 1. And you can check that this satisfies uh, all constraints for our uh, Boolean formula. And if you write the truth table, you're going to see that it satisfies all the constraints. And finally, for the NOT operator. 
So we have XH and XG. And so for the NAT operator, it's very easy. What we want is that when it is 1, it's a 0. And when it's 0, it's a 1. So I'm going to put 1 minus XH, right? If XH is a 0, then it's a 1. If XH is a 1, then it is a 0. So if you're given a circuit like this one, what you would have to do is write the constraints for each one of the variables. So I have x1, x2, and x3, which are going to be the values of all these variables that are here. And then I would need to add x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, and I already have x0. So if we want to check the output, what we do is we just solve the linear pro problem and check the value for x0. and we'd be able to read the solution directly from there. All right, so this is circuit evaluation. So what we do, we take a Boolean circuit, transform it into equations, then solve all these uh, linear programming equations with simplex or whatever we want. And from here, we can read the solution, and that's going to give me the answer that I want. Applying the rules of logic is the output equal to one. All right, so let's do another example. All right, so we're going to start talking about the max flow problem. So max flow problem has as input a directed graph. And also has uh, two spatial vertices. One is going to be called a source and the other one's called a sink. So S in V is the source. And another vertex, a special vertex T in V is called the sink. And we're also going to be given a capacity function which is a function that goes from the set of edges to positive real numbers. So the idea is to build a network so that we produce some kind of, uh, could be element, could be liquid, could be whatever, and we're going to ship it through a network. It could be like a pipe. And this pipe has a capacity. And we send this to another node. And then from this node, I could get from somewhere else, some more of this liquid, and I can send it through this network to another node, and given this capacity, and so on. So the idea is to try to find out how much of this I can send, how much of this I can ship, or how much of this uh, is the most that I can send in such a way that I'm using at capacity, whatever I can, in order to maximize the flow. So let me give a little example of how this would work. So here is a network. So how we can interpret this is we have the source, we have the sink. In this particular case that we're talking about, we have only one source and one sink. So the idea is that you can only produce whatever material you're sending in one of the nodes, and there is only one node that is going to take all the material that you are sending. Um, it's possible to have a network where there are several sources or several sinks or both, and, and it can be transformed into a network with just one source and just one sink. So this is the version that we're going to use. of the max flow problem, we're going to be using this version where we only have one source and one sink. So we have each one of these edges represents the capacity. And so what we want to do is we want to ship whatever material we're sending from the source to the sink. And so basically, what is it that we want? What is the output of our algorithm? 
the output of our, of our algorithm is going to be a function called the flow. So the flow is a function that uh, goes from real numbers, from, sorry, from the set of, uh, of edges to real numbers. But it could include the zero. I might decide that I'm not going to use an edge to send any material through that edge, okay? So it's, if it is soil, this is going to tell me how much oil I can send through each one of those edges. So what we're looking for is to find a flow function. But uh, there are several properties that the flow function has to satisfy. Uh, the first property, of course, is that the flow uh, cannot exceed the capacity, right? We're going to write in the next slide, we're going to write all the conditions that are required. But for now, just the flow cannot exceed the capacity. So the flow is a function that looks like this. So let me show you an example of a flow. Uh, an example of a flow will be something like this. So each edge is going to contain a flow. So that means that from S to A, I can send two units of oil, which of course I can because the capacity was three. Now from B to A, I'm not sending any. That's why I was say, say, saying that uh, the function can go to real numbers, positive real numbers, including zero, because I can decide that I don't want to send anything through one of the edges. Now from A to D, I can send two. Now notice, I got two, and so I can send two. There is no way that I can send more than what I get, right? So for example, here, I, can, I get four, no C, gets four, and it gets one, so I can send, I have to send exactly five because that is exactly what, that, what I got, right? So if I get, for example, A gets zero and five, which means that exactly I have to send five, knows D is going to get two and one. So from what I am going to uh, send from node D, I can send at most three. Exactly three, actually, which is two plus one is three, all right? So it has to satisfy this condition that the flow is less than or equal to the capacity, and it has to satisfy also what is called flow conservation, which is the condition that we just wrote. So let me um, write each one of these conditions um, and also, let's see what is it exactly that I want, right? So what is my output? So my output is a function that satisfies all these conditions, but also what is it that I want? I want to maximize the flow. So let's also write down what we mean by maximizing the flow. So let me... Uh, uh, formalize these concepts a little bit. All right, from what we were saying, then the max flow problem takes us input a graph, which is directed the graph, VE, a capacity function, and our output is expected to be a flow. So we have several conditions that that flow has to satisfy. So the first condition that we said is that the edges the flow that we are going to send through each one of the edges, let's say flow that goes from U to V, has to be less than or equal to the capacity from U to V, right? And also, we want this flow not to be zero, so all the flows have to be greater than or equal to zero, and that has to be true for every edge in my graph. All right, second condition was flow conservation. Flow in has to be equal to flow out. But that condition is only true for vertices that are not the source or the thing, right? So only for all vertices that are not the source and are not the thing. For each one of those, we have that the flow in. So what is the flow in? I'm going into V, right? So I have vertex V. And so I have flow that goes into V are going to come, for example, UV, right? So all those edges, UV in E, for all of those, the flow 
that goes into V, I take the summation of all of those, and that has to be equal to the flow that is coming out of V. So the flow that is coming out of V can be seen as those that go out of V, so VU, vertices, right? VU for vertices that are here. So VU in E of the flow that goes from V to U. So this is a second con condition, which we said that was flow conservation, right? And there was a third condition, that is what we want, what is that we need. And we said uh, that we wanted to maximize the flow. So what is the flow? We can actually find the value of the flow by looking at the source. So suppose that is the source vertex. If I look at all the edges that go out of the source vertex and I add up all the flow that goes out of the source, that has to be all the flow that is going to flow through the entire network. And this has to actually be exactly equal to the flow that goes into the sink, right? So this has to be exactly equal to the flow that goes out of the sink. So whatever comes out of the sink, sorry, out of the source has to go into the sink. So we want to maximize the amount of flow that leaves the source. So we can compute that, that has a name, it's called the value of the flow. And the value of the flow is equal to the summation of all the flows that actually leave the sink. So that's equal to S V for every edge uh, that is that satisfies this leaving the sink. And this is the flow leaving the sink. So S V. And this is the value of the flow, and this is the value that we want to uh, maximize. So when we say maximize the flow, what we mean is really maximize the value of the flow. So basically what we want is we want to find a flow such that the value of this flow is greater than or equal to any other value of flow for every possible flow that we can have. And every flow will satisfy these two conditions that we have here. So these are a condition for any flow. And this is a condition that we want for our solution, right? Uh, we want our solution F star to be a flow that maximizes the value of a flow for every possible flow, meaning the value of every other flow has to be less than or equal to the value of the maximum flow. So let me start with an example. And the idea is to try to figure out how an algorithm is going to work uh, to solve this problem. So we're going to try to use some algorithms that we already know. As part of the problem that we have. All right, so uh, I'm going to solve this problem. So I'm going to talk about um, Maximum flow, I'm going to talk about an algorithm that solves maximum flow. This algorithm has nothing to do with linear programming. On the other hand, we're going to see that this problem actually can be transformed to a linear programming problem, and we can also solve it by using linear programming approach. But right now, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to describe an algorithm that is used to solve this problem that is not uh, by transforming it to linear programming. All right, so let's say that I'm given an example. So the, here is my network, very, very easy network, simple network. Try to figure out what would be the maximum flow that we can send. You see, we can send one unit here, one unit here. We can also send one unit here and one unit here. So the maximum flow is going to be equal to two, right? All right, but uh, let's suppose that we are going to use some known algorithms in order to try to solve this problem. So the first thing that comes to mind is try to see if there is a path that I can use through this network. So let's see, is there a, pa is there a path that you can see that goes through this network? Can you see a path there somewhere? All right, so we can see that there is a path. For example, we can go from here to here, 
then we can go here. There might be several paths, right? But in this case, let's say that uh, the algorithm that I'm using to find paths could be that for a search, bread for a search, or whatever algorithm that I'm using to find a path is finding a path that does something like that. So uh, finds a path. And that path, suppose that does that. So I'm going to call that path an augmenting path. And I can ask, okay, how much flow can I send through that augmenting path that I just found? Well, I can send exactly one unit of flow. Suppose if this was a two, this was a two, and this was a one, I could only send one unit of flow because there would be one of the uh, capacities which would be smaller. So if I take a look at the path, I'm going to be able to send a total amount of flow that is going to be equal to the minimum of the capacities that I have at that point. All right. So um, what I'm going to do then is once I have that augmenting path, let me show you the augmenting path here. So that is the augmenting path that we found. So from here, you use the first search or whatever other algorithm you want, and you're able to find an augmenting path. So using that augmenting path, we can build the flow, right? As we said, in this case, the flow is going to be one here, one here, and one here, which is very easy, so we can find the flow that we get, right? So we can build the flow based on this. All right, so my question is, I already used this amount of flow. So, the, so how much is it left from my network? How much can I send through the network from what is left? So you see, I already used one unit here, so I can not use this anymore. I already sent one unit here, so I cannot use this anymore. I already sent one unit here, so I cannot use anymore. Now, this one is already there, right? I can still use one unit. This one is already there, so I can still use one unit. So my question next is, this network that I got, that I transformed like this, this is called a residual network. And it tells me what is left or what I can use. Now the question is, is this the actual maximum flow? The answer again, no, because we already saw that the maximum flow actually sends one unit here and one unit here so that I can get two. Which means that the problem that we are having is that this one, this one that I have here, should not be used. I should have to get rid of that, right? So how can I get rid of that? Well, I can get rid of this one by creating a flow that goes in the other way. So if I created like a flow that went in this direction, I could get actually rid of this one here. So uh, when looking at the residual network, then uh, there should be some other flows that go backwards that I could in fact use because I can actually use a flow that would go like this in this direction, right? I can use it and by having a capacity of one in this flow, that means that I would be able to get rid of the original flow because one minus one that gives me one. So I could still be able to use this one, right? So my residual network now is going to take this one here, go to, through this other one and use this other one that I have here. And then this is going to, this one is going to cancel out with this one. So I will have no flow here, but I will have one unit here, one unit here. And that is exactly what I wanted as a solution. So the idea when computing the residual network is that, um, we need to take into consideration that we might be able to reverse flow in some cases. So let me write this down. So reverse flow. In some cases, if there is something to reverse, if there is a flow, I can always reverse it. So I'm going to put one edge going in the other direction with the corresponding value of the flow. So one direction is going to be the capacity minus the flow, as we did here, right? The capacity was one minus the flow is one, but I'm going to also put an edge that is going to go backwards, that is going to contain the actual flow, 
and that is the value that can be reversed. So in this case, for example, we had an edge going from A to B, which goes in direction of one, but since I can reverse the flow, I can get rid of this one. I can go then from B to A with a value of one, which was the original value of the flow. So can, I can always reverse in the case that there is a flow. So my residual network is actually going to have two edges, one going in the one direction, one going in the other direction for each one of the pair, each pair of vertices, well, for each edge that I originally had. So let's see how to build a residual network and let's uh, do an example. All right, so formalizing a little bit what we just said, then uh, we're going to compute the residual capacity of, of each edge, which is going to give me the residual network. So let me write it down here. So we're going to want to compute the residual network. And to compute the residual network, we are going to compute the residual capacities. So residual capacities are going to be based on the flow that we just computed so far. And for a given edge, UV is going to be the following. Remember that we said that we have two, right? One goes in one direction and one goes in the other direction. The one that goes in direction from U to V is going to be based on the capacity. We say that was the capacity from U to V minus the flow from U to V, as we just wrote before. And the one that can go backwards, as we just said before, is going to be the flow and the flow is going to go backwards, right? Go instead of going from U to V, is going to flow from V to V. Right, so based on what we wrote here, we are going to compute then the residual capacities. So as we said before, I already wrote part of the residual capacities um, in the previous slide, but let me compute the correct residual capacity. So based on this flow, we can obtain the following residual capacities, which are these, right? So we already said, in the case of this edge, residual capacity, I can use no more in this direction, in the direction of the edge, but in the direction that goes backwards, I could actually give back the one that I already have. So this is the one that goes back, right? FPU goes instead of from U to V, it's going from V to U. So as you can see from here, uh, in, the, in the case that we did before, we said, okay, we can go from A to B, but from A to B, we cannot give any more because it is, this was capacity one minus flow, that is one, so this gives me zero, right? However, I can give it back which is the flow that was going backwards. So going from B to A, I can have this one. So what I do next is I'm going to compute an augmenting path using the residual network that I had here. So from here, we want to compute augmenting path. So uh, as we did in the initial case, right? We started with initial network. We can imagine that our initial network is really a residual network, but all the edges that go backwards have a zero. So we can imagine that it starts like that with a residual network. Then from here we use, we compute an augmenting path by using any algorithm or of, of our choice, depth first search, breadth first search, whatever we want. And then from here we can compute the flow, the flow so far by checking what is the minimum uh, capacity that goes through that edge and then uh, that would be the flow. And we assign that value to each one of the edges along the path. And that one is going to be called, so in, this, in the case of this example, the value that I write here, let me put it here, this is actually going to be our bottleneck capacity. So we actually find out from this path, what is the minimum capacity, and that is going to give us our bottleneck capacity. And the bottleneck capacity is going to be assigned in the flow uh, for each one of those edges. Of course, we have to add that to whatever flow was already uh, along those edges. All right, so by doing this, computing the augmenting path, we get the following. We can see that there is an, a path going from one, one here, one here, right? S, B, A, T, and we can see the augmenting path in this case. An augmenting path has to have positive uh, value. 
I cannot have a zero value, so I cannot use this edge because it has a zero. So zeros uh, are like the, the edge is not there. So an augmenting path, I can only go using edges that are labeled with a positive number. Cannot be zero. All right, so based on this, I can compute the flow so far. So how can I compute the flow so far? So in this case, how do I go to the flow? Well, I can compute my bottleneck capacity And my bottleneck capacity in this case, as you can see, is equal to one, which is the minimum capacity of the edges along the path. And then I'm going to add all these uh, values of flow to what I originally had. So if it goes backwards, then it's a, it, it, it gets subtracted, right? So for example, here, this adds a one. So I'm going to add a one here. This one here is a one, but goes backwards. So this one is going to become a zero. Then I have this one had a zero, zero plus one, that is going to be one. So what I get for my, my flow so far is going to be this graph that I have here. Now, as you can see this flow that I found, this is actually going to be uh, the maximum flow. If I compute again, my residual network based on this, we are going to see that we're going to get a zero out of S here and a zero out of S here which means that there is no way for me to move again. Let me uh, show you the residual network that we get from here. I'm going to put it right here. All right, so from here we can see that um, this is what we get. This is my residual network using this flow and my original residual network. I get this new residual network by computing the residual capacities based on this function. So as we can see now, I cannot use this uh, edge to go from S to A. I cannot use this edge to go from S to B. So there is no path going from S to anywhere. So since there is no augmenting path, I say that I'm done. So from here, no augmenting path. And so, we are done and we found this flow then is the best possible flow or the maximum flow. All right, so now we're in a position to write down an algorithm. This algorithm is called Ford and Fulkerson. So this is Ford and Fulkerson's algorithm. So the idea is let me just draw briefly a picture of what exactly we did. So we started with a residual network. So basically we can just reverse all the edges. So we have edges in one direction and edges in the other direction. And the ones that are backwards, we start with a zero. So we can start with a residual network. Let's call it GF. So from this residual network, I'm going to use uh, depth first search, breadth first search, or whatever algorithm I like in order to find an augmenting path. So here what I do is I build an augmenting path. So once I have an augmenting path, I find out, of course, uh, what is the bottleneck capacity. And given this, I'm going to be able to build a flow. And then now that I have a flow, I can use this flow together with the original residual network to build a new residual network. And now I have a new residual network, try to find an augmenting path. If I find an augmenting path, I compute the flow and I just go around this until no augmenting path is found, right? So if I'm able to do this and not find an augmenting path, then I'm going to say that I found the maximum flow. If that is the case, um, I will need to provide a proof of correctness of the algorithm. So uh, this lecture is basically based on how we're going to use Ford and Fulkerson and write down the algorithm. And next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually write uh, a correctness proof for this algorithm. All right, so based on this, we can start writing each one of the little pieces.
All right, so now I made it small. So here we have our whole process. So I'm going to write each one of these little uh, pieces that we have here, each one of those algorithms. Let me start with augment. So in order to augment, the first thing that we have to see is what we need, right? Augment takes an augmenting path. So let's see that P is an augmenting path. It takes a flow and it takes the capacity, initial capacity for the residual network that I have. So um, capacity here is going to be the actual initial capacity function, okay? So let me write them down. So P is going to be the augmenting path F is going to be a flow, and C is going to be the initial capacity. So to augment, the first thing that we have to find is find the bottleneck capacity. Let's call it B. And to find the bottleneck capacity, all we need is the path. And we need to use also um, the flow, sorry, the, the initial capacities. So with this, we can find what is the capacity of the smallest or least capacity edge through that path. So what we do is then compute the flow. So for each edge in the path, It depends if we're going in one direction, if we're going actually in the direction of an edge. So if UV is actually an edge, then remember we compute uh, the flow as the actual flow minus the bottleneck capacity. But if we go in reverse, sorry, plus the bottleneck capacity, but if we go in reverse, If we're going in the reverse, then what we do is we compute the flow minus the bottleneck capacity because I'm actually returning a flow that I initially had. And so I just return the value of the flow. All right, so that is all for augment. Let me do the computation of the residual capacity. All right, so to compute the residual network, we're going to take a flow and initial capacities. So F is a flow and C is original capacity function. So in order to do this, to compute the residual network, remember we already talked about how to compute the residual network. So basically the only thing that we have to do is for each edge, we compute the residual weight, which is going to be equal, residual capacity, which is going to be equal to, and I'm going to write, use W for the values of the residual capacity here so that we don't get confused. So the residual capacity is going to be capacity from UV is equal to, we already said capacity, U to V minus the flow, if I'm going in the correct direction, And if we're going in the backward direction, then the, the, the value of the, of the residual capacity is going to be VU equals to, remember, just the flow. All right, so that gives me the algorithm to compute the residual capacity. So the actual algorithm using both of those, so for them, Fulkerson, takes as input a graph, capacities, right? So G is a directed graph and C is a capacity function. So the algorithm could look something like this. So initially I'm going to set the, 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 the um, uh, flow equal to zero. So for each UV in E, 
I'm going to set the value of the flow equal to zero. So we initialize them. And then I'm going to set the value of the residual capacity equal to, and I run the residual function that we just wrote using the initial flow, which is just zeros, together with the original capacities. And that is going to give me the initial values for my residual network that I want. All right, so while there is an augmenting path, an augmenting path, uh, let's call it P, in the residual network, So given a graph, can compute the residual network, which is vertices, edges, including the reverse of the edges and the weight function. So computing this, I can find if I if there is an augmenting path, an augmenting path, then I can compute the flow using my augmented function that I had from before. And this is going to be augment given the uh, augmenting path P, my flow and my capacity. And from there, I can compute a new residual ne network using my residual method, using the flow that I just computed from here and my capacity. And then once this happens, I'm just going to return F, which is going to be the value of the flow. All right, so this is the entire algorithm. This is Ford and Fulkerson. So um, I guess uh, this lecture has been kind of dense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here uh, because what I want to do next is I want to prove uh, the correctness. So we need two things. We need one to analyze the algorithm. So what's the time complexity of the algorithm? And we need to uh, prove correctness. So those two things we're going to do next time. All right, that's it for today, and I'll talk to you then next time. Bye.